Good morning. Well, it's an absolute privilege to be able to come here today and to tell my story from the steps of Smallbridge. In 2006, I wrote an autobiography and I gave it the title, Once an Addict. Why? Because I was once an addict and now I'm clean. Actually, 20 years clean. Woo. And what I want to do today, I want to tell you my story. But I want to say this right at the start. I am not telling you my story to glorify my past. The reason why I'm here to tell you my story from the steps here at Smallbridge is so that you can look at me and think, if he can change, I can change. If he can change, anybody can change. That's why I'm here to tell you my story. And I'm not here to big up myself in any way. I know each and every one of you who are listening, wherever you are right now, you've got your own story to tell. We've all got a story to tell, but please allow me today just to take you into what was my world. I was living on William Kent Crescent, which is one of five blocks of flats that were in Hume, Moss Side, Manchester. And I just sold some drugs to this guy and he was walking out through my front door. Two coppers came walking past. They stopped at the door. They came walking straight into my flat and they searched it. They charged me with possession of a Class A drug. It was heroin with intent to supply. And because I had other charges, no way was they going to give me bail. I ended up in strange ways on remand in a cell with a guy called Spike. He was a drug user and I was a drug user. My girlfriend at the time was called Lisa and she would visit me every day except Sundays because on remand you couldn't have visits on Sundays but you could have visits every other day. And she would bring in the drugs that I needed so while I was in jail I was able to keep my addiction going. I'll never forget, it was a Saturday afternoon, I was laying on my bed and Spike was laying in his bed. And it was really quiet, which is unusual for a Saturday, because a lot of people get visits on Saturdays in jail. It's a busy day. But on this particular Saturday, you could hear a pin drop. And I said, Spike, he said, what? I said, Spike, why is it so quiet? He said, I don't know. Next minute, I heard the key go in the door. I'm thinking, nice one, time for my visit. Instead, the door opened, sniffer dog came in, prison officers behind it. Right, lads, stand up, you're being busted. Busted for what, boss? Busted for what we've done now? Of course we're lying. The dog sniffed around the cell. They didn't find any drugs because they'd come before our visit. But they did find all the drugs paraphernalia that we had in the cell, so they put us in the block. They put us in solitary confinement. And on the Monday, we had to go and see the governor. The governor added five weeks to our sentence and he sent us back to the block for five weeks. So by now I've gone Saturday, Sunday, Monday without any heroin in my system. I wasn't feeling well. My back was aching. My legs were aching. I was hallucinating. I wasn't sleeping. I was rattling big time. You see, I was an addict. But let me take you back to the beginning of my life because my starting life was pretty good. I was born in Salford in Manchester. Went to primary school, didn't like it. Went to secondary school, hated that even more. I left school at the age of 16 with no qualifications and that's when I met Craig Huey and Psycho. They were using recreational drugs. They were smoking weed, taking amphetamine, using LSD. And I started to hang around with them and take the same drugs they were taking. See, we were young and we were determined that we was going to live life to the full. It was a Friday night. We were in Jackie Marshall's bedroom. She lived on a council estate in Salford. Nine of us were crammed into Jackie's bedroom. We were smoking weed, listening to Bob Marley and the Wailers. The windows are vibrating with the bass line. We've got money in our pockets and we get ready to go to Manchester as we did every weekend. And the door opens and knew he, one of the lads came in. He says, hey guys, I've got some brown, I've got some heroin who wants some. And I'll never forget the look in Craig's face. He was always the first to jump in. He said, I'm up for it. You, he said, I'm game. Cycles has own well game. And everybody in the room had the heroin for the first time. And I was the last one. Come on, Woody, it's your turn. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be the odd one out. I don't want to be left out of the crowd. I want to be in with the crowd. And I was injected with the heroin and I didn't really enjoy it. All I did was scratch and run to the toilet and be sick. None of us went to Manchester that night. A few more days passed, we had it again. And then we had it again and again and again. And before you knew it, we were taking it every day. We used to go to a pub in Manchester called The Union. We used to go every weekend. 
And I liked it in the union that much that I started to go in on my own without Craig, Huey and Psycho. And I got friendly with this mixed race girl who was selling weed small time. She'd buy an ounce and break it down into deals and make a profit. Then she'd buy another ounce. So as I'm hanging around with Kareen, I'm thinking I could do that. So I started to buy small amounts of weed, break it down into five pound and 10 pound deals and sell it. And I built my own customer base up in central Manchester. I started to make decent money. At weekends, I'd sell amphetamine as well. LSD was popular in those days, so I'd sell that. And I made even more money. One day I was in the union and I was sat opposite Karina. She was sat talking to this white girl with blonde hair and blue eyes and they were having a conversation between themselves. And they kept looking at me. And I remember the white girl going to the toilet and Kareen coming over to me and she said, hey, that's Lisa, she fancies you. Okay. So I went to a club that night and Lisa came in after me, so I bought her a drink, gave her a lift home, and I started to go out with Lisa. She was 11 years older than me. When I was with Lisa, I remember we moved into a block of flats called Meredith Court. They're still there today. I was there with Channel 4 TV five years ago, filming my story. That became my first base to deal drugs from. So now people could come to my flat to score. It was when I was in Meredith Court when I started to sell heroin. There was a massive market in those days. Not a lot of people were dealing brown. So I started to buy quantities of heroin and sell it, and I made even more money. Everything was going great. I had a nice car, I had nice clothes, I had a nice flat, I had a nice looking girlfriend. Everything was sweet. And then I got nicked. I wasn't given bail, I was remanded in custody in strange ways. I was under 21, did some time on remand, came out, straight back to the drugs, straight back to the crime. Wasn't long before I was arrested again, got put back in jail. Did a sentence, came out, straight back to the drugs, straight back to the madness. I was on that treadmill. I remember coming out from one sentence, I'd been in Preston prison. In those days, Preston was a jail where you did your bird, now it's a local jail. And Lisa met me at the gate, and I remember as I got out, I was buzzing, I've got my discharge grant in my pocket, I've got my train pass to get me back to Manchester. I said, come on Lisa, we're going to go and celebrate. All I want to do is get off my face. All I want to do is get stoned. And we landed in Manchester, we got off the train, we got a taxi to Yume. By now Lisa was living on the ball rings. First thing that I did, I went to my doctor's, got my Valium, my df 118s my Tamazepam that I used to sell. Bought loads of amphetamine because I just wanted to celebrate getting out of jail. And I'll never forget, it was two o'clock in the morning and I was whizzing off my face. And I used to like music, mainly reggae music when I was a kid. And I used to recall from two pirate radio stations. And I was tuning the dial trying to lock into these two stations. And I locked to a, into a station that was playing house music. And I'd never heard house music before. This was before it had come to the UK. And I said to Lisa, have you heard this, Lisa? This is house music. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a studio. And I'm going to start to make house music. And I just sit in the corner of my flat and then I bought like a little a mixer and then I bought a drum machine, then a sampler and a keyboard and over time I built up this studio and I just sit there creating beats, making house music, taking loads of amphetamine. One day, two day, three day, one month, two month, three month, I'm still there whizzing out of my face, no sleep. Nine months later I'm still sat on that still, skinny as a rake, hardly been out the front door. Then right out of the blue I started to hear voices. Real, evil, horrible, aggressive voices. I said, Lisa, have you heard this, Lisa? Have you heard these voices? She said, no, there's no voices there, Barry. I said, don't you tell me there's no voices there. She said, it's all in your head. I said, don't you tell me that. I went to see a doctor. The doctor referred me to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist diagnosed me as having amphetamine psychosis. I was sent to Chiro Psychiatric Hospital. That was the lowest point of my life because now I was out of control. Flash forward nine years. I was still hearing voices. I'd split up with Lisa. I'd lived in three hostels. I spent a year living in James Street Salvation Army Hostel in Salford. I spent eight weeks living in the Salvation Army Hostel that was in Rochdale and I got kicked out for having a fight with the Scouser. Then I spent a few weeks in Leopold Court, the council run hostel. But then I got a little flat down Thimbles Close just up the road from here. It was great because nobody knew my business. I'll never forget, I'd lived there for five weeks. Thursdays were the best day of the week. That's when I got paid. I remember coming out, going to the post office on the main road here, cashing my book, 
getting on the bus to go into town. The bus takes off, it stops at the next stop, and this guy gets on the bus. He's got a barstool dot tattooed on his face, which like is a tattoo beauty spot. He's got a big fat neck and short stumpy fingers. And he got on the bus and there was only two seats spare. There was one next to me and one opposite. And he walked past that seat and he sat on the seat next to me. I wasn't in the mood for a conversation, but he was, and we got chatting. And he was really friendly. I remember getting off the bus in Rochdale Town Centre, thinking that guy was all right. He had something that was different. That was the Thursday. The following Sunday, I was taking my dog for a walk past Birchill Hospital to the big fields behind it. And as I'm walking past the hospital, who should I bump into again? The guy that I'm on the bus with the barcel dot, the big fat neck and the short stumpy fingers. I said, you all right, mate? How are you doing? I asked him where he'd been. He said he'd been to church. I thought, oh, no. He's a Bible basher. He says, you can come if you want. He says, we meet every Sunday in the hospital grounds. He says, there's no way, mate. Church ain't my thing. That's not what I do. I remember the next day taking my dog for a walk, walking past Birchall Hospital. And as I'm walking past, I'm looking for a church building. But I couldn't see a church at all. On the Wednesday, I had an appointment with my new psychiatrist since moving to Rochdale from Salford was the last place that I lived before he came out here. His name was Dr. Samuel Yangi. And I remember chatting with him, didn't think, he didn't think anything of that conversation. Then that afternoon, taking my dog for a walk, looking for a church as I'm walking past Birchall Hospital. No way could I see a church. Friday morning, there was a knock on my front door and I opened it, it was this little woman. It's actually her sat there. About four foot nine. <laughs> she says, you all right, cook? I says, yes. Yeah. She says, I'm your next door, but one neighbour, my name's not, I've come to introduce myself. She said, you've just moved up from Salford, haven't you? I said, yeah. She said, your dad drives a red car, doesn't he? I said, he does. She said, you've not got much furniture. I'm thinking, you're a nosy. <laughs> she said, I've just bought a brand new fridge freezer. She said, if you want my old fridge freezer, because I know you've not got much stuff, you can have it for free. But I'm going to be honest, Dot, I had a fridge freezer, but I did take yours and I sold it to our kid for 20 quid. Why not? And we chatted on the doorstep and I said, Dot, she said, what? I said, Dot, last Sunday I was taking my dog for a walk past Birchall Hospital and I met this guy and he told me that he went to church in the hospital grounds and this week I've been looking for that church and no way can I see it. Do you happen to know where it is? She says, yeah, I go to that church. I'll take you on Sunday if you want. I'm thinking, I didn't want that. No, I just wanted to know where it was. Sunday morning, she knocks on me front door. We both walk up Birchall Road together into the hospital grounds and she takes me into a prefab that was attached to what was then the Bateman Centre. Remember walking into that place, everybody was dressed really casual. Remember sitting down, second row from the front, Doc was sat on the end, I was sat one in. I remember looking at my watch thinking, what time is this going to be over? Get me out of here. Then there was a tap on my shoulder. I looked round. It was a guy there on the bus with the barcel dot, the big fat neck and the short stumpy fingers. He says, you all right, mate? How are you doing? You're doing all right? I didn't think you wanted to come. Well, I didn't want to come. I says, but this is Dot. He says, you don't need to introduce me to Dot. I know her well. He says, well done, Dot, for bringing him. I think these two have been conspiring against me. He sits on the other side, his wife and his kids fill the rest of the row up. I'm now sat between the two of them, thinking again, beam me up, Scotty. And then I heard the words behind me, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Look round, and my Nigerian psychiatrist walked through the door. What are the chances of that? You moving to a place, it's like you moving to central Salford, living there for five weeks, you know nobody. Then throughout a period of ten days, you meet three people, and all of them are in that a little prefab, what they're calling church. It felt really uncomfortable. It felt, felt really strange. And I'm thinking, these guys must have set me up. Then the service started. And then the guy gets up to speak. He's actually sat there. And I remember at the end of his little spiel, he said this. I'll never forget. This was 20 years ago. He said, we believe in a God who can heal. He said, is there anybody in this room with any issues? I'm thinking, does he want someone with issues? I've got plenty of those. He said, our God is able to help you and heal you if we pray for you. He said, if you want to be prayed for, come to the front. And you know when I think about it? Throughout my life, I always had a small amount of faith. I always believed in something. I didn't know what I believed in. I never went to church. Never did any of that. But I always believed that there must be something out there. But I didn't think about it often. And I had prayed a few crisis prayers in my life, particularly when I was in jail, asking for bail. God, give me bail. But I never got bail when I was in those police cells. But he was telling me that his God can help me if he prays for me. And he said, if you want to be prayed for, come to the front. And I got out of that seat and I walked to the front. And he asked me what I needed prayer for. And I told him I was a heroin addict. 
I told him I was on 55 mils of methadone and I told him that I was hearing these voices, that I was suffering from amphetamine psychosis. And he started to pray for me. And I remember as he was praying, he kept repeating, in the name of Jesus. I didn't know why, it didn't make any sense to me, but he kept saying, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And at the end of his prayer, as he was praying, something started to happen to me. I remember I was shaking as he kept repeating this phrase, in the name of Jesus. I remember... Tears running down my eyes, I was crying. I remember having a feeling inside like there was fire, like this intense heat. And I'm thinking, wow, what's going on here? And he said, amen. And he sat down and I remember walking back to Dot, who I was sat next to. And I said, Dot, what was all that about there, Dot? She said, oh, that's God, love. (laughs) I'm burning inside, Dot. She said, that's God, the Holy Spirit. I remember walking home that day into my flat, walking through the front door, standing in the hallway and listening. And the voices that I'd heard for nine years had gone. Within four weeks, I was off the heroin, I was off the methadone, and I realised that God could take my mess and turn it into a message. That he could even take my negative experiences and use them in a positive way. I remember that afternoon, I got a phone call from the guy that I met on the bus with the barcel dot, the big fat neck, and the short stumpy fingers. He said, hey, there's a guy coming to speak tomorrow night in Durnley Methodist Church, just around the corner from your house, and his name's Noel Proctor. He said, do you want to come? And as soon as he mentioned that name, I thought, I remember Noel, because he used to be a chaplain in Strange Ways. So I thought, I'll go and listen to what Noel's got to say. And I went to this meeting, it was full, and this is my interpretation of what Noel said that night. He said, there are faults, flaws and failures in all our lives. I'm thinking you're right there. So 2,000 years ago, 2,000 miles away, God became a man. His name is Jesus. He said, Jesus is God with skin on. He said he came to this earth, he lived on this earth, and he was tempted just like you, but he resisted. But at the age of 33, he allowed himself to be nailed to a cross to take the rap for you so that you could have a brand new start. He said, is there anybody in this room who could do with a brand new start? I'm thinking I could do one of those. He said, if you want a brand new start, come to the front. And I got out of my seat and I ran to the front. And that's when I prayed a prayer to give God consent to come into my life. You see, God is not a burglar. He'll never try and burgle his way into our life. If he was a burglar, he'd come at night and then he'd try and kick in the back door. If he couldn't kick in the back door, he'd try and kick in the side door. If he couldn't kick in the doors, he'd try and jam me in through the downstairs windows. That's if God was a burglar, but he's not. God will only ever come in through the legal entry. The legal entry to a house is usually the front door. The front door to a life is the will. That's the legal entry. And on that night at Durnley Methodist, I gave God consent to come in through my front door. And since then, my life has been dramatically changed. Since being married, I went off to study at a college and did really well. Then in 1999, I set up a little charity that spends a lot of time working with prisoners throughout the UK. And it's great to be back here to share my story from the steps of Smallbridge because this is where my journey began. And I don't know about you, wherever you are, your journey can start today. There's going to be some stuff going on this afternoon, but if you come through this door, into that corner, somebody's going to be there if you want to speak to them about you starting a new journey. You see, maybe that you need a new start. Do you know God can give you a new start? That's what this celebration is about. Yeah, we're talking about the Queen, but actually it's about celebrating what God can do through a person and in a person's life. Thank you very much for listening.